and I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to get going. So we are starting with the basics. What's a program? How do I deal with data in a program? And strengths. Everything in Python is a strength unless you tell it otherwise. So because of that, we have to get really comfortable with strengths. And this week, we're going to introduce a lot of stuff. And next week, we're going to start diving. And each week, we will dive deeper and build on what we've learned the past week. So this week is just the basics. So what is a program? Well, a program consists of three steps. It can, consists of input, process, and output. Input is just getting data, getting information into your program so you can do something with it. Process is modifying that data. You're going to take some piece of information, let's say an age, and you're going to do something with it. Maybe you're going to, you know, calculate when you can get Social Security, whatever. That's a process. And output is giving information back. So for this week, our input is going to be command line stuff. And I'll explain to you the difference between how PyCharm works and how Zybooks works. Um, and output is, again, it's going to be output to the console or output to Zybooks. And process is really what your script is doing. So that's the program flow. And that is the program flow that we will follow for every single program we we'll write. Kathy. Can I ask everyone to mute, please? All right, so what are our building blocks? Well, the first building block is a variable. A variable is a name that holds a piece of data. Now, the piece of data can be my name. It could be Lisa. It could be a number, 42. It could be a bank account balance, 10.01. It could be lots of things. There are data structures we're going to get to later in the class. Um, but the variable is the basic building block. It's the place we start. And a variable has three basic elements. It has a name, it has a value, and it has a scope. Now, I want you to, I want you to hear the name scope because we won't really be talking about scope until later in the semester, but I like to introduce the concept now. When we start getting more complex in our programs, the scopes of the variable mean things might or might not work. They can, by putting your variable in the wrong place, you create a logic problem. So the name is a unique identifier. That's what a name is. The data is just data that is stored in the variable. Now, every single, um, actually, I'll talk to that in the next slide. Um, and it exists in a scope. For almost everything we do in this class, it's the global, global scope. And you don't have to worry about it. So a variable has a name. So the name has to start with a character. And it cannot contain spaces or special characters. So. Alphanumerics is fine, underscores is OK. But you cannot have a dollar sign in a variable name. Python won't let you. So I have, before I can do anything, I have to define a variable. So I have to tell Python that the variable exists and then what I want it to do with that variable. What we see on the screen here is the name is the word amount. The value is 10. And in between that, there is what I call an assignment operator. The assignment operator is a single equal sign. And it instructs Python to store the value on the right-hand side of the single equal sign into the variable on the left-hand side of the single equal sign. So what do I mean by that? Well. Every single va value in Python and in any programming language takes up space. Computers have 
two resources. They have space and they have speed. Speed we're not really going to get into in this class because we're not doing things that you know are like real-time programming. Space, you always have to worry about space. So if you're thinking about Python, you can think of this as a name column and a value column. And each value is going to take up a certain amount of space. Um, and some values can take up a lot more space than others. In this case, we're not taking up space because 10 is an integer. So every time you create a variable and assign it to a value, you are carving out space like it's like an address you're carving out space and then you're naming that space I have a house my house has an address so the address isn't my house the address is a reference to my house so the variable is a reference to the value and it's a named reference that I can pass around all over the place and change now when I am reading a script how do I know that something is a variable well I know it because a variable is always on the left hand side of a single equal sign so if I am defining a variable I'm going to have the variable name the assignment operator and a value even if that value is zero or an empty string that's what you have to have this is the minimum building block does anybody ask any questions Nope. Okay. So let me go and oh by the way one of the things I haven't said yet is in this class you are not required to do the challenges. The challenges are not part of your grade. I encourage you to do as many challenges as you can but what is part of your grade are the participation activities and the labs. The challenges are not graded. So you will see that I have every the solution to every challenge here. And that is because I don't have a problem with giving you guys solutions to the challenges. I think it's beneficial for you to try a challenge and then come back and see what the solution is. So that maybe you maybe you learn something from that. Um, so here are all of the challenges and let's say variable this is just uh, let's see variable this is just uh, an example of a variable now um, understand that oh sorry let me go back this is pie charm what you see in front of you is pie charm and I know that you're not supposed to start dealing with pie charm until week two I like to introduce it now and I like to introduce it because the sooner we start understanding PyCharm the better you are going to have to produce a game at the end of this class and in eight weeks that sounds like a long time from now it's not so getting used to the tools earlier I think is better so I start introducing this now in every lecture I give you will see me using PyCharm if you have questions about PyCharm ask I will be happy to answer them so what we have here oh, I gotta get rid of that notifications where are they uh, hold on sorry I joined sorry, late I apologize. I apologize oh you don't have to worry about it I just don't have my notifications set up right I'll okay. worry about it later. okay Sorry. You're fine. So basically what we do is I ask everyone to quiet their mics. If you have a question, put it in the chat. And then after the lecture, we'll open up the microphones and people can ask any questions. But I will try and answer any questions in the chat as we go. So this is PyCharm. PyCharm is where you're going to write your scripts that are not done in Zybooks. And so there's a couple things I like about PyCharm. The thing I like the most is the debugger. The debugger allows me to step through code and actually explain to you what's having happening at every line. Python um, 
is both an interpreted and a compiled language, but either way, it runs through a Python virtual machine. And what that means is it's not running directly on the computer, it, on the computer hardware. It's, a, it's separated from the computer hardware, which allows me to write code that can run on my Mac and run on my Windows machine and on my, run on my Linux VMs at work. That's a very powerful thing because when I started in programming many, 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 many years ago, we had to recompile things for each different operating system and sometimes that required writing different code to have something run on a Mac or have something run on Sun Microsystems. So this is very powerful. It is very similar to Java in the fact that they're both write once, run many. So. What do I have in front of me? What I have in front of me is a very simple script. This very simple script has a variable named myVar. That variable is originally set to 10, and I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And then I have this thing called print. We're going to talk about print in a minute, but this is how you um, output data to the console, and when I'm grading your and running your games and your other projects that are done in PyCharm, I'm going to put them in here and run them. Um, and so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to run this. I want to step through this so you guys can see what's happening. Python runs things one line at a time. Uh, where is it? There it is. Okay, so here, and I apologize for the small screen, here are some very handy things. First of all, I set a configuration for my, my Python script. So my Python script will run. That tells PyCharm what it's supposed to load up and run. I have an arrow here, and that arrow says run my script, and a little thing that looks like a bug that says debug my script. I am partial to the debugger. So we're going to run the debugger and you just saw the bottom of this screen change. Well first of all we have something called the console and the console is where I as a user interact with the program. Now this is very rudimentary and basic. Okay, you guys are used to, you know, swiping your finger across the screen, or I assume most of you guys are used to swipe, swiping your finger across the screen, using a mouse, um, and graphical user interfaces. Well, we don't do that in this class. We use text-based interfaces, which means I have to interact with the program by typing. The only way I can do that is with a console. So we have this tab down here called console, and the console is where I'm going to input stuff and it's going to output stuff, and I'm going to input stuff and it's going to output stuff. So the console is very important because that's where I'm going to put stuff and we're going to talk about input in a minute. Then there's this handy dandy little frames and variables that I get to use if I'm using the PyCharm debugger. And why is this important? Well, let's watch. If uh, This is step over. You'll see me using this a lot. It's the bent arrow. And what I'm doing is I'm telling Python to execute a line of code. Rather than Python just running each line and me hoping I understand it, I'm actually going to tell Python when to execute that line of code. This red dot tells Python to stop and go no further unless I tell it to. It's called a breakpoint. And the way I set a breakpoint is I simply put my mouse near the number and I click. So there is a red line. I know that I am at a breakpoint and the program is running because of this blue line. And we'll keep going through this. You guys don't have to remember all of this right away. But I want to introduce it. So if I step over line three, you will see down here that my var equals int 10. Now, int means it's an integer, and we'll get into types in a minute. And then if I go back to console, right before I run the next line, 
I know what line I'm about to run because of the blue, because it's highlighted in blue. I step over and I've just put 10 out to the console. Now I'm taking that same variable, my var, just because it's here twice doesn't mean it's a different place in memory. In fact, it is the same place in memory. And this little thing indicates that it's a place in memory. And what you will see when I step over line 7, down here, my var is now 12. I did not create a second my var. I have a single my var, and I just changed the value. And then I'm going to print it. And then here's just some examples of some escape sequences that we're going to talk to a bit. So here I have 10 and 12, and then I'm going to print the escape sequences, and my program is done. So quick introduction to PyCharm while looking at variables. Yes. So sorry about that. So this allows you to check each line separately. Yes, it does. It will allow you to check each line separately. It will let you run to a specific place. Debuggers are great. I love debuggers. I know I'm a geek. And we will, as we go, this is not the only time I will show you PyCharm. I use PyCharm throughout all of the lectures. So how do I use a variable? So I use a variable by a couple of different ways. Well, I set it. Variables have to be set and have something to store. A variable cannot exist without telling it what it's going to store, even if what it's going to store is a zero or an empty space. So I have a bunch of different variables here. I have something called total coins. Total coins is my variable name. I have, I have a variable called nickel count. I have a variable called dime count, a variable called total coins, and I have the assignment operator. Now, my assi I have a bunch, bunch of assignment operators, and I can do that. Okay, I have total coins, nickel count, dime count, total coins. I also know these are variables because they're on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. That is, that is a giveaway. Okay, if there's a single equal sign and you look to the left, you are looking at a variable. So I have nickel count. Okay, nickel count equals input into input. That's just a way of getting information in from the console, and I'll show you that in just a minute. But I can then use nickel count once it's been assigned to do things with. In this case, I'm going to add nickel count and dime count together. And I'm going to get the total number of coins. And I'm going to print that out. So that's what I do. So a variable contains a piece of data. And when I use that variable, Python goes out and it grabs the data. And it puts it in place. So if I have nickel count is 5 and dime count is 10, then what Python is going to see is, 10 plus, or 5 plus 10 in total coins is going to be 15. So let's talk about variable types. There are four types of variables in Python for basic types. There is a string, which is an ordered collection of letters. And we're going to do a deep dive into strings next week. An integer, which is just a whole number. 10 is an integer. 42 is an integer. A float. 1.11 is a float. Anything with a decimal place is a float. And a Boolean. And we're going to talk about Booleans in Module 3. Just know they exist. Okay. So a string is my stir equals Lisa. Lisa the, the word Lisa can't exist on its own in Python. It has to exist as part of that variable storage stuff. The variable name pointing to a, a place in memory that contains a piece of data. So my stir equal Lisa. My int is 42. My whole number is 3.14. So, sorry. So that's, that's what they are. And that's how you represent them. You will notice that my stir has quotes around it. Those quotes 
Tell Python it's a string. My int, that 42, does not have quotes around it. Python knows that that is an integer. And my float does not have quotes, and it has a decimal place. So Python knows, just by the way I put it in there, that that is a float. So we're going to foray into functions for just a minute, because this is the point in time where we need to start using functions. We won't write functions for a while, but we are using them. So Python provides a lot of goodies, a whole lot of goodies that we can just use. We don't have to do anything. We only have to know they exist. So, and those goodies are functions. And a function is simply a grouping of statements that is given a name. And we're going to do that ourselves later on, but for functions, you can call that function by a name and have it do something for you. You get a lot of stuff for free. So what is the specific format of a function call? Because there's a function definition and a function call. Right now we don't care about the definition. We just care about how to call it. So you call it with a function name and potentially some arguments and parentheses. You have to have an open and close parentheses after the function name. So we have a function name, we have an open parenthesis, and we have a closed parenthesis. And some functions will have information in between those parentheses. So why did I just go from functions to converting types? Because when you convert types, which you have to do in the labs, you're going to have to use a function. Okay, so if I am looking at converting a string to an integer, which you're going to have to do because every time you get data from the console, it's a string. So I'm going to have to convert something. I mean, it says 42. My store equals 42. Why isn't that an integer? It's not an integer because it has quotes around it. And because it has quotes around it, Python has basically checked the box that says this is a string. So Python won't allow you to do things with a string that you can do with an integer or a float. You can't add, sorry, you can't divide strings. You can divide integers, you can divide floats, but you can't divide a string. So to do any arithmetic operation on that, on that, on 42 from Meister, I have to convert it. So what do I do to convert it? Well, there is a function. The name of the function is int. And it takes as an argument a variable that contains a stir, a string. So in this example, I have a variable named myster. I have assigned to that variable the string 42. I know it's a string because it's in quotes. I have then on the next line created a variable called con, C-O-N-V, and to that I am assigning myster, but I'm using the int function to convert it to an int, to an integer. And then the int is just one of those free functions that Python gives you, and I don't have to know what it does inside. All I have to know is that if I pass it a string that contains, a that just has an integer, as the string, that it will come back as an integer and I can do math with it. This becomes important in most of the labs this week because you're going to be taking input from the console, you're going to have to convert it to integers or floats, and then you're going to have to do arithmetic operations with it. So, string to float. I have a string that has 3.14. I'm going to convert it using the float function. So I have float, open parenthesis, the variable that contains the string, and a closed parenthesis. That's how I call the float function. And it will then take um, the value that's in Meister, and it will create the float out of it, and con will be a float. And I can convert an integer or um, a float to a string. 
And the way I just do that is the stir function. So just like I have int and float, I have stir. Stir is a function. So I have an open and close parenthesis. And inside that, I have whatever I want to turn into a string. So those are converting types. And we're going to talk about them a little more when we go over the labs. So input and output. Input and output are big. You're going to be using the input function and the output function until week eight. They, that, that runs through the entire class. So input is a function, and that function allows me as a user on that console to give a piece of data to a running program. Because there's just, you got to have a way to get data in and out. And the way you get it in is the input function, at least how we're doing things, because we're doing everything text-based. Um, print allows you to output data to the console. So when I'm running your game, I expect that I will be inputting information, and you will be processing that information and returning to the console information that I need to keep running the game or basically saying, sorry, you lost. So that's what input and output for, and they allow us to communicate with the program. So the program doesn't generally run in a vacuum. There is always some reason to have a program running. And so programs take in data and they give out data, input, process, output. So how to call the input function. So down there is Professor Lisa, and I'm testing my student code. And this is challenge 1.34. And I'm going to read two numbers from user input, then print the sum of those numbers. So here we're going to do input. We're going to convert to, from strings to integers. And then we're going to do output, so input process output. So. What you see here on the left-hand side is a little flowchart. And while we haven't gotten into flowcharts that much, I wanted to introduce them because you will need to learn know more about flowcharts. But also, it's a good way to communicate and review things with you, like labs, with, with, and, and allow you to understand the process without giving you the answer in Python. So. The first thing I'm going to do is start the program. It's always got to be running. And then I'm going to input something. Well, how do I input something? I have num1. Num1 is the name of a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And by the way, I'm going to say that a lot for the first two weeks, and you're going to get sick of it. So to the right-hand side of the single equal sign is int open parenthesis. So I know that I'm going to convert something to an int. Then I have input, open and close parenthesis. And that input is what's going to allow me to type something in to this running program. And then I have close parenthesis. Now, parentheses have to be balanced. So you will notice that I have two open parentheses and two closed parentheses. And when I go in and we actually run this in PyCharm, I am going to mess things up a little bit and show you what errors look like. So then I've got my variable name. Sorry, I should have hit all that function name. Open parentheses, close parentheses. And so I'm going to input the number 2. So num1 is going to be 2. And that's my input. num2. I'm going to do a second number. It looks very much like the first one. I've got int as the outer function, input as the inner function, and I'm going to type in 4. So that's, again, more input. Now my process is going to be outputting num1 plus num2. That's my pro oh, that's actually output. My bad. Output is six. I'm sorry, num1 plus num2 is process. 
I should have done that differently. And print is output. So let's go and actually look at challenge 1.134. Yes, I am recording this session. I always record all of the sessions and I put them up on my YouTube channel. Um, so let's, and I know that I'm already running a lot late and I apologize. So 1.134, this is, let's make this bigger, sorry. Come on. All right, let's make it smaller. Why is it doing that to me? Hold on. I don't know why this is doing this to me. All right, I'm closing this real quick and I'm opening it again. Oh, there we go. So anyway, here, let's just do this. <laughs> I'll show you what errors look like in PyCharm. Come on. I don't know why it's not allowing me to make this bigger. I really am trying. Let's search. Nope. Okay. I apologize for this being so small. I don't know why it's not allowing me to make it bigger at this point. So. When you see a red squiggle like that, I really do want to make this bigger. When you see a red squiggle in PyCharm, it means there's a syntax error. Something is wrong and it needs to be fixed. Now, you always want to go back to the first squiggle and then maybe, okay, thank you, Vera. Um, so maybe, some, well, sorry, go back to the last squiggle. And sometimes you have to go back a line before that. This happens to be that my parentheses aren't balanced. I have an open and a closed parenthesis. Let's edit the configuration and I'll run it. Uh, 1.3.4. And I will get an error that is a syntax error. You will see this down here. Oh, my bad. I don't know why this changed itself. All right, so I want to run this again. And what you see here, why is this? Okay, let's do that. All right, good. So I just removed a parenthesis. So all I did, I took away one parenthesis and all of a sudden I get red lines. When I run this, I get this num2 equals in input and there's a syntax error. And you're looking at that line and going, but there's no syntax error in that line. There is no syntax error. I know there's no syntax error. And you would be completely right. The problem is that in the line before it, I forgot to, cl to close a parenthesis. I forgot my closing right parenthesis. I only ha I have two open and one close. So, Python doesn't know that though. Um, I'm a programmer and programmers are notoriously bad at writing error messages, including programmers who write programming languages. Um, so, and, and sometimes it's a matter of when you know that something went wrong. So Python is telling you that on line 14 something went wrong, but we know that's not true. So to find out what's wrong, oftentimes you have to go back a line or two or three or four sometimes. But just because you don't see the actual syntax error on the line that Python is telling you doesn't mean it's not a syntax error. It just means Python did a crappy job of telling you where the real error was. So to correct that error, all I have to do is put a closing parenthesis in the right place. So now I've got my breakpoint on line 13, because that's where I want to stop. And by the way, this is a comment. I don't talk enough about comments sometimes. This is a multi-line comment, and Python knows if it's a comment to just skip it. It's not a runnable line of code. 
So I know it's a multi-line comment because it has three single quotes to start it and three single quotes to end it. So now I'm going to debug and I'm going to stop on line 13. Now here I am at the console and nothing's happening yet, but I'm going to step over. And I know because there's an input that it's waiting for me to put a number in. So I'm going to put 5 and I'm going to hit the Enter key. Now you'll notice up here that something changed on line 13. One of the nice things about PyCharm is it's going to tell you num1 is now 5. That place in memory that num1 points to now has the number 5 in it. And then I'm going to go over it again and it's waiting for input and I'm going to put 10. And I'm going to hit the enter key. And when I do that, Python now says num2 is 10. So I've just had two inputs where I have done two conversions and then I'm going to just output num1 plus num2. And it's 15 and the program ends. So a lot of stuff happened in three lines. Um, and it can be a little daunting. Take baby steps. Just take baby steps. It's okay. You can run your labs in Zybooks as many times as you want. And my suggestion to students is if you have a line of code that is bad or that is not working or is giving you fits, comment it out. So maybe I want to start this program like this. Let's just assume those two lines are there. And by the way, the pound sign is a single line comment and it basically tells Python, ignore this line. So I'm going to make this bad again. And then I'm going to print num1. Okay? So I'm going to run it. And I, I, I removed complexity for just a few minutes by, by commenting out those lines. So I'm going to run this. And I'm going to have the syntax error on print num1. Same syntax error because I forgot my closing parenthesis. So I'm going to add my closing parenthesis. I'm going to run it. So I'm going to do 5, and it's going to output 5. I've just had a success. That's great, but that's not what it wants me to do. So now that I know how this int input thing works, all I'm going to do is copy it. Copying and pasting is completely okay. And I'm going to make it num2. And now I'm going to print num1 and num2. And this is what I mean by baby steps. This is how I program. And it is generally the best way to do it. So it's waiting for a 5. I'm going to give it a 10. And it's going to say 5 and 10. And I don't need these two anymore because I just tested that num1 and num2 were working. So now I can, I don't need that line anymore. Now I can just print out num1 and num2. Now, let's see what happened if I forget to convert one of these to an integer. So I'm just using input. Input works on its own. Input takes anything and you can have data in it. So, so I can input another number and you'll see that come to the screen. So let's do my favorite thing in the world which is debugging. I have a console. I'm going to step over. I'm going to input 5. Now I have no int. There's no conversion going on here. So I'm going to step over and I'm going to input another number and I'm going to say 42. And now I have, if I look at my variables over here, you will see that 5 is an int because I have this int function here. And 42 is a string. Stir right there. I can't add an integer and a string and get an integer out of it. So, and you'll also know it on the screen here because there are quotes around that 42 right here. So now I'm going to step over and I'm done. You'll also see this little lightning symbol here, which means there was an exception thrown. So if I go to the console, I see this lovely line of exception. 
This lovely line of exception basically unsupported operand types for plus, int, and stir. And what that means is you can't add an integer and a string. It just doesn't work. So that's because I did not convert num2 to an integer. Now why am I spending so much time on this? Because four out of your five labs are going to need this. So I can do an int and correct all of that by just adding the int function call. So I'm going to stop this. This time I'm just going to run it. I'm going to input 5. I'm going to input 42. And I get out 47. So I think I have beat challenge 1.3.4 to death enough. Can we go back and enhance the screen? I will try to go back and enhance the screen on the next one. Vera, hopefully it will work. I don't know why it didn't work on this one. So we're going to now continue on. So how to call the print function. Well, we just saw how to call the print function. But there's multiple ways to call it. And this is important because sometimes you don't you, you want you want it, your output to look different than what the standard. So you can call the print function with a single argument, just whatever you're going to print. It can be a string, it can be an integer, it can be a float. Now when I do that, um, first of all, print is the name of a function, so you can't use it for a variable. You have an open parenthesis, you have an argument, and you have a closing parenthesis. And the argument is just what you're going to put out to that console. Now, and in this case, we're just going to put 321go to the console. Now, I can call it with two arguments. And I have the ability to change what happens at the end of the print line. A print line in Python, Python always, um, always assumes a new line. But maybe you don't want a new line. Maybe you want a space. So this is how you do it. Now, Python, you can use the print function, what you're going to print, and then how you're going to end it. And this is, I think, 1.21 needs this. So because they don't want you to print it on different lines, they want you to print it all next to each other. And Python will always, once it executes the print function, if it doesn't have an end, it will simply do a carriage return and go to the next line. It's just like you're sitting on your keyboard and you hit that enter key. That's what happens. You can just assume that Python is typing for you and it's going to hit that enter key. This end equal quote space quote says, don't hit the enter key Python. And so again, we have our function name, we have our open and closed parentheses, and we have, in this case, two arguments. And in between the two arguments, there is a comma. Arguments in functions always are separated by a comma. And what it's going to do is it's going to print line one. It's going to then, instead of a new line, put a space. And then the next line, it says the word continued, and it's going to print it right next to it. And so these are just some rules. For every open parenthesis, you have to have a closed parenthesis. Print ends in a new line unless you tell it not to, and all arguments are comma separated. And then the end equal quote space quote tells the print function to end in a new line. So we're going to go here. Uh, that wasn't it. I don't know what I did with that challenge, but OK. All right, let's see. Maybe it's simple strings. Convert challenge, simple add. Nope, sorry, did the wrong thing. We'll keep going. I'm running way behind anyway. 
So, the secret life of a Python script. Input, process, output. I'm going to keep going back to this, by the way, for this week and next week until you're sick of it. All right, so this is basically just the following program calculates yearly and monthly salary given an hourly wage. The program assumes a work, an work hours per week of 40 and a work week year of 50. So there's an hourly wage equals input, and I'm going to put in 20. And then I am going to process. I'm going to say yearly times hourly. Yearly equals hourly times 40 times 50. Now, does anybody get what I just did wrong? There's a big error here. The error is that I forgot to put in this script to convert hourly wage to an integer. So everything after that hourly wage is going to fail in PyCharm. So 4000 as 40000 is what you're going to make a year. Monthly and hourly, if this actually worked, is going to be $3,200 a month. And then I'm going to output annual salary is yearly, 40000 and then monthly salary is monthly. So I'm going to correct my error so I don't do it again. Yes. No comma. Never mind. Okay, that's fine, Kaylin. So what I forgot to do here is this. Okay, now it's correct. Don't know how I missed that last time. Okay, statements and expressions. Um, statements are usually input and output statements, and expressions are where you're doing some form of calculation or data modification. That's basically it. Or I'm, I'm like going to keep you guys so late right now it's not funny, so I'm not going to go into any kind of more detail about that. Now, for Python, cases and spaces matter. What in the world do I mean by that? Python is a case-sensitive and space-delimited language. So you can't assume two things are the same just because of the same letter in, an alpha, in the alphabet. X equal 2 is not the same as capital X equal 2. Those are two separate variables because one is a lowercase x and one is an uppercase x. So Python is a case-sensitive language. A lowercase x is different than an uppercase x. And a lot of students get caught up in that one fact. You know, they define a variable, and then they're trying to use it later, and then they define it as a lowercase x, and now they're trying to use it as an uppercase x, and they can't figure out why they have this syntax error that the variable doesn't exist. If, if, the, if you know you've defined it, and it says that variable doesn't exist, check the case. So, lowercase x, uppercase x. What do I mean by space delimited? Space delimited simply means that Python knows when you end a statement by whether or not you have hit the new line. So if I have x equal 2 and y equal 4, I have two valid statements. One is, they're each on separate lines, and they have to be in Python. That's good. Python will be happy. If I did x equal 2 and y equal 4 and they were all on the same line, Python is going to tell me that's a big old syntax error. So not all characters are visible. Every character has a numerical representation. So we have something called an ASCII table or UTF-8 table. Excuse me. We'll stick with the ASCII table right now because for most of what we're doing, it has all the characters in it that we need. Um, most computers these days are UTF-8, and UTF-8 is just more characters. Um, characters are not visible. A space is not necessarily visible. A tab is not visible, and a new line certainly isn't. But all of these have numeric representations, and in fact, all um, 
characters have a numeric representation and your computer doesn't know anything about the letter A, but it has a whole lot more knowledge about, what is it, 42 or something, whatever the numerical equivalent of A is. So there's numerical equivalents for every single letter in a program, every one. And so sometimes when you're dealing with input and output, you can see it. And sometimes you can't. A tab you cannot see. A new line you cannot see. But they may very well still be there. So how do we deal with these? Now these are strings. Okay. Uh, these are all dealing with how you're handling them in the string. And the nice thing about the numeric representation is that your computer can in fact handle a tab because it doesn't have to worry about it that it's visible or not visible. It's just a number and it knows if it hits the, the number 9 that it's supposed to tab over so many spaces or space the cursor over so many. So here's just how you're handling special characters. Backslash is your friend or is that slash? I can never remember. It's backslash. So in strings, and this gets a little bit tricky sometimes, in strings sometimes you want to represent some things that are not normally representable easily. For instance, backslash. To have a backslash in a string you have to put two. To have a single quote inside of a string that is surrounded by single quotes you have to backslash it. To add a new line into the middle of a string, you have to do a backslash n. That's the equ equivalent to a new line. And the same with tab. It's a backslash tab. Now, you're going to need some of these for formatting later, but we're going to go through them also next week. So just a quick foray into arithmetic operators, just like your math operators, plus, minus, multiplication, division, and exceptions. Just, just like the stuff we learned in math. Um, so let's go out. I hope I didn't go through some of that so fast. So, um, well, let's do this. Let me go through the labs. And if you guys have any questions, we'll also look through the challenges. I'm just trying to not keep you till forever tonight. Okay. So here's where we go, the lab overview. Now the lab overview is basically me talking through the problem and showing you the logical flow. Now a logical flow doesn't always equal one-to-one -one line of code. So you'll see a block in here. Sometimes it represents a single line of code. Sometimes you're going to have multiple blocks for a single line of code. But this is the logical representation of the flow of the program. And I find that a lot of students get syntax without a lot of problem, but learning how to think in a logical flow from a word problem is not always easy. Um, and if you're going to be a programmer, you need to understand how to take these word problems, which we call requirements, and change them, get them to, to work in code that meets somebody's requirements, meets someone's needs. So right now we're going to talk about Lab 1.9 and what does Lab 1.9 want us to do? Well, it's going to, there. now this says complete the program, so Zybooks is actually giving you a good amount of code here. Um, to read four variables from input. So here we're going to use the input function four times and store the values in variables. Now these are the variable names. First name is a variable name. Generic location is a variable name. Whole number is a variable name. And plural noun is a variable name. So you're going to have four lines of code, each one with one of those variable names, an assignment operator, and then the input statement. So. What's the logical flow? Oh, and then output um, a story. Sorry, I forgot to read that. So input first name, input generic location, input whole number, and input plural noun. So you're going to have four input statements. And then 
I'm going to output, it says, the program uses the input values to output a short story, and you'll have the format of that short story in Zybooks. And then you're going to output, and then your program's going to end. So let me go into Zybooks really quick. And there, 1.19. No, I'm not showing you any um, any solutions. So this is how it reads, and these are the examples. So let's talk about what Zybooks does and does not do. Here's the definition, and basically what Zybooks here is doing. Um, is this is a line of code, okay? And this is a line of code that they're already giving you. So we have four variables, first name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. So you have to simply define those four variables, because they haven't been defined yet, and allow Zybooks to put in information. Because what's going to happen is that even though up here, Zybook says Eric Chipotle 12 and cars. That's not what it's going to put in every time. It's going to put in all kinds of different inputs and expect your output to be the same. So I've had a lot of students who simply put the word Eric for first name, the generic location as Chipotle, um, and that's not going to work. They're going to fail because this is just what they're using as an example. Zybooks is going to throw all kinds of different data at your program. So that's why you have to do it in a way that allows your program to be data independent. And writing and, and substituting first name for Eric is not data independent. Saying that is not data independent, that is data dependent. First name will never be anything other than Eric, but we want first, thing, first name to be whatever Zybooks wants it to be. So this is where you're going to put input, and that's what you're going to do for first name. Now, I'm not going to tell you to do anything more. I'm going to take that away, but that's where you're at. That's where you're going to start. So this is about defining variables and letting Zybooks put data into those variables. Um, a lot of students get tripped up by Zybooks like that. And then you're going to tell it to run the program in either develop mode or submit mode. Develop mode, you can do develop mode as many times as you want. Doesn't matter. It'll tell you how many of its test cases it was successful on. And the minute you hit however many, you know, if there are five test cases and you got five, you're perfect. Um, for my students, I always encourage you, before you start to get really frustrated, take a screen capture of your code and send it to me. And any errors that you're getting from Zybooks, if you can send those to me, then I will do my best to give you hints to move you forward. Oftentimes, there's a small thing that's getting overlooked. Um, or there's a misunderstanding about what the program is, what Zybooks is asking you to do in the program. So always reach out to me um, for my students. So that's what 1.9 is, and that's what Zybooks is going to do. Now, Zybooks is going to say you passed or didn't pass because it's doing an exact match. Spaces, new lines, tabs, they may drive you crazy. Again, if you're in my class, send me the script and, and say this is what it's telling me, and I can tell you whether it's just a space issue or if Zybooks is just being a pain. Sometimes Zybooks is just being a pain. So let's keep on going for 1.10. So here we're going to create have a variable like usernum. So usernum is a great variable name. That's what we're going to use. And it's going to store a value like an integer, which means it's going to store an integer. And then we're going to output the user's input, and we're going to output it squared and cubed. And then we're going to get a second number and do the sum and the product of the two. So I'm going to have 
two input statements, several process statements, and several output statements. So if you see the word variable or, you know, can store a value like an integer, you're being asked to use the input function. If it says get a blah, 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 you're being asked to use the input function. That's how you read this. So I've always start. My program's got to start. So I'm going to input user num. And then I'm going to convert user num to integer. I'm going to then square user num. I'm going to output the squared user num. Whoops, my thing was in the wrong order. I'm going to cube user num because I only had to convert it once. Once it's in an integer, it's you can just keep using it. And then I'm going to output cubed user num. Now I'm going to input user num to new variable. It's a new variable. I've just assigned it to something, so I have to convert it to an integer. Now I'm going to do the sum of user num and user num2, and I'm going to output the sum. I'm going to do, um, I'm going to multiply them, so I'm going to do the product. I'm going to output it, and I'm going to end. So that's the pattern. And this is a pattern that you're going to use again and again and again. You're going to input it. You will probably convert it. You will do some kind of process. So here, inputs and outputs are always going to be the off kilter, um, the off kilter rectangle. Process is always green, and it always it's the rounded rectangle. And in week three, we're going to get a diamond. So lab 2.1, write a program using integers, user num, and x as input and output user num divided by x three times. So I've got two inputs. I've got user num, and I've got x, and I've got a single output state. Well, I'm going to output thing. Sorry, my brain really slides into, into an abyss at 10 o'clock. Out, you're going to out, have three separate output statements because it says output user num divided by x three times. So I'm going to start as always. I've got some input to do, so I'm inputting user num. I'm inputting x. I'm converting user num to integer. I'm converting x to integer. Kind of seems a little bit like the last program. Now I'm going to divide user num by x. I'm going to print it out. I'm going to divide, um, I'm going to say div2 equals div divided by x. I'm going to output div2. And then I'm going to assign div3 to div2 divided by x and output divided by 3. And in this assignment, you cannot just do user num divided by x and then user num divided by x and user num divided by x. You have to do the assignment in between because that's really what Zybooks wants. 22, write a program using inputs age, years, weight, heart rate, time, and um, respectively, and output the average calories burned. So and there's a calculation for Zybooks. So output each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point. Now this is one of those things I don't consider fair because we don't really talk about string formatting. But this is what you do. This is exactly what you do. You will have a calories variable and you will just type this exactly like it is but make sure you have a calories variable. So we're going to use inputs and outputs as usual like we did before. So I'm going to input age weight, heart rate, name, sorry, time. I'm now going to convert all these guys. Okay, I'm going to convert weight, I'm going to convert age, I'm going to convert heart rate, and I'm going to convert time. And now I'm going to calculate calories. The calculation is provided in Zybooks. And then 
I'm going to output what the calories are, just like that, and I'm going to end. So this one's a little bit more complex because we've got a little bit more to do, but it is the same basic pattern. Input, process, output. And ending. So this is the last lab. And by the way, it's not always five labs a week. Some labs, some weeks you're going to have two. Some weeks you're going to have three. This, and what's the other week? One of the other weeks has four in it. So here we're going to prompt um, a user to input an integer between 32 and 26, float a character in a string, um, and output those in a line separated by a space. So remember when I talked about that print statement with the end? That's what you have to use here. And then reverse it and then convert the integer to a character by using the care function and output that character. We didn't really talk much about the care function, but it's just like int and float. So input is user int user float, excuse me, user care, user stir. I'm going to output everything. Now you'll notice I didn't convert the integer and a float to anything yet because I don't need to. I'm not doing calculations with them. I'm not adding integer to something. So they can remain a string until I need to do a calculation with them. There's nothing wrong with that. So I output it in one order, and then I output it in the reverse order. And now I'm going to convert user int to a character by using the care function. Oh, I have to, I have to make it an int before I do that. And I'm going to output the character, and then I'm done. And down here, there's a reference to how to use the care function from W3Schools, which I find to be a very good site. So that's the lecture. Now, I'm going to invite everybody who wants to to open up their mics and ask any questions, put everything, put anything you want in the chat. I am here to answer whatever you need. And I'll wait about 30 seconds, and if nobody says anything, then I'm going to call it. I, I hate your same fucking letter. Can I'm sorry, I couldn't up? hear. Can you, can you up your mic a bit? Yeah, let me try. Can you hear me? I can hear you a little bit better. Yeah, what I'm saying is like, uh, I heard you saying like, uh, challenges is not a part of these classes. I didn't quite understand it, you know. Can you... Is there a particular challenge you, you didn't understand? Or is it just, I mean, the challenges are not required. They are not part of the rubric and you are not graded on the challenges. The labs you're graded on and the activities you're graded on. Okay. Was that your was that your question? Yeah, that was my question. Yeah, I was just okay. gonna make sure. Yeah, no, it's not in the rubric. It's not part of the grading criteria. You're graded on the participation activities and the lab. Uh, thank you. No problem. And keep a close eye on the participation activities. They we had a lot of pro I in my classes had a lot of problem last term because they didn't always transfer like the students thought. You have to hit submit. By the way, you may do a few activities, and then if you look at your bright space uh, grade, you'll see that it's like an F. And that's because it's just keeping track of what you did. You can continue to work on it, and it's not a problem. The proper term, um, the, the term can be pound sign. It can be comment. Um, not all programming languages use the pound sign to comment. So, can you um, and the term may depend on the programming language. I always call it a comment. I write in multiple languages. Today I was writing in Python and Java and Bash. 
And Java and Bash and Python and Java don't do the same thing for comments. Their symbols are different. So I just call it a comment. Um, pound sign is fine. Hash, ta hash is fine. Um, it, that, there are two schools of things that I, I divide programming into. I divide it into flavor and function. Flavor is, um, you know, how do I describe that? You know, is it a pound sign? Is it a hash? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Some people call it hash. That's flavor to me. And, and it's nowhere near as important as getting the logic right in a program. So there are people that I have worked with who are, you know, who will argue over function names. And it makes no sense to me. I have better things to do with my time. So if I don't have a problem, whatever you call it, as long as, if, as, long as you put functions in your code and those functions are, um, and this, um, sorry, as long as you put comments in your code, my brain is fried. As long as you put comments in your code and those comments indicate to me that you know what you're doing. Does that, does that help, Carlo? Um, that's fine. The assignments are due, shoot, Sunday or Monday? It's either Sunday night or Monday night. I think it's Sunday night. The assignments are due Sunday at 11.59. Um, the discussions, and there are two forms of things that go on in the discussions in this class. One are true discussions. You put some stuff out, you got to respond to the, um, to at least two of your classmates, and that's a discussion. There are also discussions that are really more in the form of papers. You are not required on those to um, respond to your students, but they do expect, thank you, Alicia, for clarifying that. Um, they, they are more like papers. You don't have to respond to other people, but they expect certain things to be provided in the answer. It's not as much of a, um, just kind of an opinion. It's more of describe this or explain this or, you know, tell me three things. So um, there are two types of discussions. The discussions, the original for discussions, the original is due Thursday. And if you do have to do comments, comments are done on Sunday. Anybody have any other questions? Going once, going twice. Hopefully all this will be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, have a good evening, everyone. I'm stopping the recording, and I...